the National Broadcasting Company present transcribed Sir Ralph Richardson in Theatre Royal. This is Ralph Richardson. A short while ago in this series, we played for you some scenes based on sequences from Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. Today, for your pleasure, we have some scenes from the second of the two books upon which his fame rests, A Sentimental Journey. If we can succeed in capturing the spirit of that book, we shall deal in a measure of delight for I find it one of the most charming books I know. Two hundred years ago, Lawrence Stern paid a visit to France and anticipated much of the misfortune and the good fortune too, which is attended upon generations of tourists right up to the present day. Come with us, won't you, as we take a step back into the France of two hundred years ago and take, with Lawrence Stern, a sentimental journey. The whole circle of travellers may be reduced to the following heads. Idle travellers, inquisitive travellers, lying travellers, proud travellers, Vain travellers, splenetic travellers. Then follow travellers of necessity, the delinquent or felonious traveller, the unfortunate and innocent traveller, the simple traveller, and last of all, if you please, the sentimental traveller, meaning thereby myself. And the reason for my sentimental journey through France? It all happened very simply. Disgraceful, Mr. Yorick. I repeat, disgraceful, sir. Yes, my lord, I am of your opinion. Absolutely no flair for these things, the English. No sensibility, my lord. They order this matter better in France. Uh, you have been in France? Well, my lord, no, I... Uh... You mean, sir, you have not been in France? No, my lord, but... Then, sir, I have nothing further to say. Strange that one and twenty miles sailing, for it is absolutely no further from Dover to Calais, should give a man these rights. I decided to look into them, and went straight back to my lodgings, put up half a dozen shirts and a black pair of breeches, took a place on the Dover stage, and the packet sailing at nine the next morning, by three I'd got set down to my dinner upon a fricasseed chicken, sentimentally but unequivocally in France. Monsieur is on his travels, he will need a carriage. I shall be happy to sell him one to suit his needs. Thank you. I've seen one in your yard which rather took my fancy. A désobligeant. Oh, but monsieur, a désobligeant, it's too small. There is room inside only for the one. But I'm travelling alone. Besides, it stands there looking so sad and neglected. It stands there swinging reproaches at you every time you pass by it. If monsieur will excuse me, I will get the keys of the coach house. You shall see something better by far. I am more costly by half. I shall be overreached by three or four louis d'or. Yorick, Yorick, avarice, base passion. Thy hand is against every man, and every man's hand is against thee. Heaven forbid, monsieur. Madam, forgive me, I didn't see you. Heaven forbid, indeed. Allow me. You have hold of my hand, monsieur. Fair lady, this must certainly be one of fortune's whimsical doings. To take two utter strangers by their hands and in one moment place them together in such a cordial situation as friendship herself could scarce have achieved for them had she projected it for a month. And your reflection upon it shows how much she has embarrassed you by the adventure, monsieur. Ah, madame, it is merely that I am an English philosopher. 
My heart knew it, but my brain couldn't let it alone. But um, you've been in London? No, monsieur. Then you must have come from Flanders? Yes. Perhaps from Lille? No. No Arras? No Cambrai? No Gong? No Brussels? Uh, yes, monsieur. I live in Brussels. Ah, and you are going by the Paris road? Yes, monsieur. As far as Amiens. As far as Amiens. Then perhaps madame would... Uh, uh, pardon me, madame. If monsieur will step into the coach house, I will show him a few of my carriages. Thank you. After you, madame. If monsieur intends to travel alone, I have here a disobligeant which... No, 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 no. I must have a coach for two, I think. Monsieur would find a disobligeant very uncomfortable. Yes, yes, indeed. Perhaps uh, this carriage would suit monsieur. That will scarce hold two. It is altogether too small. Have the goodness to step in with him, madame. It is larger than he believes. Excuse me, monsieur. I, I shall be back in a moment. <laughs> Another of fortune's whimsical doings, monsieur. C'est bien comique. There wants nothing to make it so but the comic use which the gallantry of a Frenchman would put it to, to make love the first moment and offer his person the second. It is their forte, monsieur. It is supposed so, at least. They have certainly got the credit of understanding more of love and making it better than any other nation upon earth. But for my own part, I think them errant bunglers. Indeed, monsieur? What a want of knowledge of love-making a man betrays whoever lets the word come out of his lips till an hour or two at least after the time that his silence upon it becomes tormenting to a lady. A course of small, quiet attentions, not so pointed as to alarm, nor so vague as to be misunderstood, with now and then a look of kindness and a little or nothing said upon it, leaves nature for your mistress, and she fashions it to her mind. Then I solemnly declare, monsieur, that you have been making love to me all this while. I never finished a ten-guinea bargain so expeditiously in my life as I did in buying the carriage. And what a large volume of adventures may be grasped within this little span of life by him who interests his heart in everything that time and chance hold out to him as he journeyeth on his way. Indeed, I lost my portmanteau from behind the carriage, twice got out in the rain and once up to my knees in dirt to help the postillion tie it on before I got to Montreuil. But surely Monsieur needs a servant. There is a clever young fellow here who would be very proud of the honor to serve an Englishman. Well, let him come in then, by all means. Allah Fleur! A la fleur! This is the English gentleman who needs a servant. Ah, if Monsieur would only give me the chance to prove myself. Well, you suit me very well, La Fleur, I'm sure. I suppose I should inquire what you can do, but I shall find out your talents as I want them. Besides, a Frenchman can do everything. <laughs> you can uh, uh, shave and dress a wig a little. Ah, oh, Monsieur, I have all the disposition in the world. It's enough for heaven, La Fleur. It ought to be enough for me. The next morning, La Fleur entered upon his employment. I delivered to him the key of my portmanteau, bid him fasten all upon the carriage, get the horses put to, and he cantered away down the road before me as happy and as perpendicular on his post horse as a prince. And in such a sort, we arrived before nightfall at Amiens. Comte de la Fitte has brought you this letter. It is from Madame de Comte's sister, whom you met in the coach house at Calais. Whom I met where? In... Ah, uh, uh, yes, so he told you that, did he? Now, I wonder how he found that out now. It was a billet from the lady of the carriage in which she said she'd taken the liberty, having seen me arrive at the inn, to charge me with delivering a letter for her to a Madame Renault, a friend of hers at Paris. There was only added that she was sorry to have no chance to wish me a bon voyage once more in person. But should I happen to find myself in Brussels... 
If uh, Monsieur will pardon the liberty. Well, La Fleur, what is it? I told the valet of Monsieur le Comte that you would want him to carry a reply to Madame. Oh, but of course, I'll write it immediately. Here are pen, ink, and paper, Monsieur. Uh, oh, thank you. Now, let me see. Um, cher Madame. No, uh, ma cher Madame. I am. Uh, no. A thousand apologies for the liberty, Monsieur, but. Uh, I have a letter in my pocket written by the drummer in our regiment to a corporal's wife. You have... Uh, I dare say it would suit the occasion, monsieur. Then, pretty, let me see it. La voilà, monsieur. Madame, I suffered most grievously and at the same time was plunged into despair by the unlucky return of the corporal, which puts our meeting again this evening quite out of the question. But, vive la joie... All mine is thinking of you. Love is nothing without sentiment, and sentiment is still less without love. Let us not despair. Monsieur le Corporal mounts guard on Wednesday, and then it will be my turn. Chanceux et son tour. Till then, vive l'amour et vive la bagatelle. I am, madam, with the most respectful and tender sentiments, yours alone, Jacques Rock. Monsieur thinks that the letter will serve? Why not? It is but changing the corporal into a count, saying nothing about mounting guard next Wednesday, <laughs> and the letter will be neither right nor wrong. Let me take the cream gently off it, whip it up in my own way, seal it up, and send you off with it, and tomorrow be on our way to Paris. <laughs> When a man can contest the point by dint of equipage and carry all floundering before him with half a dozen lackeys and a couple of cooks, then it is very well in such a place as Paris. He may drive in at which end of the street he will. But if a poor prince is weak in cavalry and whose whole infantry does not exceed a single man, he had better quit the field. <laughs> I own my first sensations as soon as I was left solitary and alone in my chamber at the Hotel Modern were far from being so flattering as I had prefigured them. I walked gravely to the window in my dusty black coat and looking through the glass saw all the world in yellow and blue and green running at the ring of pleasure. Alas, poor Yorick, cried I, what art thou doing here? Come in. Monsieur has been inquired after by the lieutenant police. But deuce take it, and I know the reason. I'll be back. He spoke about you with the innkeeper, monsieur. It was your passport that he required, monsieur Yorick. I told him I would ask you for it. Monsieur has a passport, of course. A passport? Not I, faith. I left London in such a hurry, it never entered my mind that we were at war with France until I was at Dover. Oh. The Comte de Liège offered me a place in his packet, and so I embarked, and I never thought more of the matter. Monsieur has no passport. Oh, then he has perhaps friends in Paris who can procure him one? Not that I know of. But, Monsieur Yorick, you, you will be sent to the Bastille, or the Châtelet, at least. Ah, oh, Pooh, the King of France is a good-natured soul. He'll hurt nobody. Cela non prospère. You will certainly be sent to the Bastille tomorrow morning. I'm sorry, my dear sir, but I won't hear of it. But, monsieur, if you have no passport... I'm sorry, the Bastille is quite out of the question. But, monsieur, how can you say such a thing? You know perfectly well I've taken lodgings for a month and I'll not quit them for all the kings of France in the world. Oh, Bertie, these English men are the most extraordinary people in the world. In a moment, we continue Theatre Royal, starring Sir Ralph Richardson. Keeping informed in this busy world of ours sometimes gets to be a problem, doesn't it? Events happen so quickly, you're often too busy to hear it all and to get the real story. Well, NBC solves that problem for you with a series of exclusive news features every Sunday, designed to bring you up to date with the headlines. And not only that, also to take you behind the headlines where you'll hear the inside story and meet the people who are making news, all on Sunday, a day when you have the time to sit back and hear it all. 
For example, there's a two-hour program called Weekend. Weekend is your Sunday newspaper, bringing you all the news from front page stories to society page, fashion news and baseball news. You'll hear it all on Weekend, as reported by such expert newsmen and women as Tex and Jinx McCrary, Leon Pearson, Merrill Muller, and many others. This Sunday and every Sunday, let NBC Radio do the job of keeping you informed. The easy, the complete way. The NBC Radio way. We now continue Theater Royal, starring Sir Ralph Richardson. I had treated the matter of my passport quite cavalierly when first the innkeeper raised it, but it needed no more than the sight of a caged starling in the passage to his courtyard to remind me how sweet a thing is liberty. I can't get out, I can't get out, said the starling, and mechanical as the notes were, yet so true in tone were they chanted and so apt their comment that in one moment they overthrew all my disregard of the Bastille. I'll go directly, said I to myself, to the Comte de Brissac. How the Count's name occurred to me is a story in itself. I had heard it that very morning in a bookseller's shop where I'd inquired for a set of Shakespeare's works. Bonjour, monsieur. Good day, monsieur. I should like to buy a set of the works of Shakespeare. Ah, <laughs> monsieur... Uh, but I have not a set of the divine Shakespeare in all the world. Come on. But there's a set here on your counter. Oh, monsieur, they are not mine. They were sent me only to get bound, and I am to send them back to Versailles in the morning, to the Comte de Brissac. Does the Comte read Shakespeare, then? Oh, monsieur, c'est un esprit fort. He loves English books. Mm -hmm. And what is more to his honor, monsieur, he loves the English, too. You speak this so civilly that it's enough to oblige an Englishman to lay out a Louis d'or or two in your shop. Have you the wanderings of the heart, monsieur? Uh, the wanderings of the heart? Oh, certainly, mademoiselle, in two volumes for three livres. Thank you, monsieur. Good day. Uh, good day, mademoiselle. Uh, good day, monsieur. Though I had often thought of the pretty little fil de chambre, it had taken the threat of the Bastille to remind me of the bookseller and his patron, the Comte de Brissac. But now, when a passport seemed more important to me than all but liberty itself, the Comte came again into my mind. And on the following day, with La Fleur to escort me, I made the journey to Versailles. And with more than a few misgivings, I presented myself to the Comte de Brissac. And to what am I indebted for this pleasure, monsieur? Monsieur le Comte, I've come to you with none to present me because I knew that I should meet with a friend of yours in your presence who would do it for me. A friend? Here, monsieur? He is at your elbow now, Monsieur le Comte. It is my countryman, Shakespeare. Ah, uh, Shakespeare. <laughs> but of course. Uh, please sit down, Monsieur. What can I do for you? In a word, Monsieur le Comte, I've come to France in such a hurry, I've forgot my passport. I'm told that I must apply to one, to a friend of some standing in Paris, and I've no such friend. Unless I can find somebody to vouch for me, I shall be sent to the Bastille. But as I happen to hear that you were an admirer of our English genius... Oh, oh, oh. c'est bien dit. Hmm? Well, your passport. <laughs> Shakespeare is full of good things. He forgot only the punctilio of telling me your name. My name is in Shakespeare, and if you'll pardon me, I'll show it to you. Lear Macbeth Hamlet. Aha, here it is. Monsieur le Comte, me voici. Uh, Yorick? You are Yorick, monsieur? 
I embrace you. <laughs> then I will write out your passport for you at once. <laughs> to the lieutenant governors, mayors of the city, generals of the army, this is to bid you grant free passage to Monsieur Yorick, the king of England's jester and his baggage. Excuse me, Monsieur le Comte, but I'm not the king of England's jester, not even the king of Denmark's. But you are Yorick, monsieur? Yes, my name is Yorick. And you make jests, monsieur? <laughs> yes, monsieur le comte, I make jests. But I'm not paid for it. <laughs> Don't be poor, monsieur. So much the worse. <laughs> but monsieur will get along just as well with this passport as any other. <laughs> Goodbye, monsieur. And a pleasant journey. Mr. Yorick, the king's jester. I own the triumph of obtaining a passport was not a little tarnished by the figure I cut in it. But there is nothing unmixed in this world, and while we can still afford to smile at ourselves, we shan't go far to the bad. Indeed, the courtesy of the Comte, no less than the good humor with which he had bestowed it, placed me once more in the debt of his country, which knows so well how to scatter the largesse of its genteel sentiments. And I will freely own that nothing puts me in debt to a kindness more than the free and sensible manner of its conferring. Hail, ye small courtesies of life, for smooth do ye make the road of it. Like grace and beauty, which beget inclinations to love at first sight, is ye who open the door and let the stranger in. Good day, monsieur. Good day, madame. Would you have the goodness to tell me the way to the Hotel Modern? I seem to have lost my way. But of course, monsieur, most willingly. I had given a cast with my eye into half a dozen shops as I came along the street in search of a face not likely to be disordered by such an interruption. Till at last, this one hitting my fancy, I had walked in. She was working a pair of ruffles as she sat in a low chair on the far side of the shop, facing the door. Très volontiers, most willingly, monsieur. You must turn first to your left hand, mais prenez garde, there are two turns. And be so good as to take the second. Then go down a little way and you'll see a church. When you are past it, give yourself the trouble to turn directly to the right. And that will lead you to the foot of the Pont Neuf, which you must cross. And there, anyone will do himself the pleasure to show you. I turn first to the right. No, no, no. You turn first to the left, monsieur. Uh, first uh, to the left. First so. to the left. But be careful to take the second to the left, and not the first. Second to the left, my dear. Then when you have passed the church, turn to the right, monsieur. Cross the Pont Neuf, and then inquire again. Thank you, madame. I am extremely obliged to you. I will not suppose it was the woman's beauty, notwithstanding that she was the handsomest grisette I think I ever saw. But I'd not gone ten paces from her door before I found I'd forgot every tittle of what she had said. So looking back and seeing her still standing in the door of the shop as if to look whether I went right or not, I turned back to ask her the way once more. Oh, is it possible? It is very possible, madame, when a man is thinking more of a woman than of her good advice. Wait, monsieur. The boy is taking a parcel into the same quarter, and if you will have the goodness to step inside till it is ready, he will show you the way. Will you come in and wait for him? He will be going in a moment. And in that moment, madam, I would say something very civil to you for all these courtesies. Anyone may do a casual act of good nature, but a continuation of them shows it is a part of the temperament. And certainly, if it is the same blood which comes from the heart, which descends to the extremes, I am sure you must have one of the best pulses of any woman in the world. Oh, you had better feel it, monsieur. Willingly, madame. Uh, 
Uh, oh, oh, moi. There is nobody but my husband, monsieur. Um, <clears throat> and monsieur is so good as to give himself the trouble of feeling my pulse, Jacques. Oh. Monsieur does me too much honor. <clears throat> monsieur will be so good as to excuse me. Good day, monsieur. Uh, good day, monsieur. <laughs> I'm here. <clears throat> Been quite put out of my reckonings. And how does my pulse beat, monsieur? With all the benignity, madame, that I expected. Monsieur is very kind. The parcel is ready, madame. Madame Roland's gloves. Oh, apropos, madame, I need a couple of pairs myself. Oh, certainly, monsieur. May I measure monsieur's hand? Oh, please do, madame. Monsieur has a very small hand. <laughs> If he will do me the goodness to try this pair, yes. Oh, no, 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 they are too large for monsieur. Uh, allow me to help monsieur. Uh, perhaps then this pair would fit him better. If monsieur would be so kind. <laughs> no, they are too big as well. I must apologize for causing madame so much trouble. Oh, but it is no trouble at all, monsieur. I am desolated that I have nothing which is quite right for monsieur. <sighs> Monsieur has a very small hand. <laughs> Madame is right. <clears throat> Shall I take the parcel to Madame Roland, Madame? Uh, wait a moment, Pierre. I wish you to show this gentleman the way. Yes, Madame. Well, Madame, Madame, it's, it's no matter. This couple of pairs will suit me very well, I think. If Monsieur is really sure, that will be five livres, Monsieur. Uh... Five livres, but madame. But, monsieur, do you think that I could ask a sou too much of a stranger? And a stranger whose politeness alone has done me the honor to lay himself at my mercy. Does monsieur believe me capable of that? Uh, uh, faith, no, no, not I, madame. <laughs> and if you were, you are heartily welcome. Ye small courtesies of life, smooth do ye make the road of it, like grace and beauty which beget inclinations to love at first sight. Tis you who open the door and let the stranger out. Le Fleur. Yes, monsieur? Pack my bags and settle the horses at once, Le Fleur. We are leaving Paris, monsieur? Aye, Le Fleur, we are leaving Paris while we can do so in good order. And thou, great governor of nature, wherever else thy providence shall place me for the trials of my virtue, whatever is my danger, whatever my situation, let me feel the movements which rise out of it and which belong to me as a man. And if I govern them as a good one, I will trust the issues to thy justice. For thou hast made us, and not we ourselves. Monsieur, perhaps, is in love? With one princess or another, La Fleur, every moment of my life. Vive l'amour, monsieur. I, La Fleur, vive l'amour, et vive la. Bagatelle.